you say? Um, okay, so I'm printing, presenting a graph neural network framework for causal inference and brain networks paper. It was a nature paper from a few years back. Um, our group has interest in causality and uh, some of the methods that I've been working with use GNNs. And uh, my, master's, my master's work uh, involved graphs and dynamics sort of in a very primitive way compared to this. And uh, some of this, so it just seemed pretty interesting. I thought it would be a good thing to represent for everybody's interests. Um, so a challenge in neuroscience is basically linking dynamic brain interactions to structural backbone and demonstrating causal relationships between brain regions and SSRI. And this paper basically uses uh, DTI structural data and uh, fMRI uh, in order to demonstrate causal relationships between brain regions. <clears throat> so starting with the basics of causality, so uh, basic, uh, Clark Ranger came up with the concept. And uh, as I read the paper and kind of like got more and more familiar with the concepts, uh, it sort of became clear that the that there's limitations to Ranger's causality, but uh, the basic idea is that um, it, it's like basically correlation plus time in a, in a way. So it's like if uh, uh, if if you have a correlation that like some knowing about something helps you predict another thing that happens in the future, then there's a causal relationship. Um, and some of the, some of the uh, the methodologies that are used to demonstrate this are vector autoregressive approaches, which I go into in more detail later about. But this is basically a linear uh, autoregressive method to predict uh, sequences like time series and how to study them and help you determine how value. Uh, one of the values of uh, uh, vector order progression is that it works for larger scope brain networks because it's, uh, it's fairly simple. So uh, I don't know, I'll put this slide here that hopefully covers. Uh, Sergey to interject something about the potential strengths or weaknesses or lack thereof of uh, Granger causality. But uh, in my, my impression is that the like Granger causality, as I understand it at this point, seems like you could make inferences like like umbrellas cause rain or something like this because like knowing about the umbrella helps you predict the rain. Um, clearly, clearly, there's not like a there's a something like a bidirectional. More of like the rain causes the umbrella, umbrella than the umbrella causes the rain. But um, and I, from what I've read, there's the limitations is that if there's feedback loops or bidirectional causality, then uh, great ranger causality fails. Well, there is a um, a bigger problem. It doesn't detect, or it's not built to detect uh, common causes and observed common causes. So yeah, yeah. If, like uh, um, if if um, the, the system is uh, causally sufficient, where causally sufficient means there are no unobserved common causes. Any causes of two or more variables are present in the system. Then probably graphic causality is a okay uh, substitute, but then it just doesn't have a concept of unobserved common causes and correlation versus causation. Mm -hmm. Because that, that's what you have in the figures. Just add it. Uh, so there's another technique called dynamic causal modeling, which sounded more interesting, and I'd, I'd do my best to touch on, but uh, I'm sure working with it would uh, provide much more depth and much more understanding than I can provide today. But So basically, um, it's, uh, so there's these two equations, and the first equation represents the underlying neural activity. So it's decoupling the concept of like what's actually happening from what's what you observe. So the second equation is basically the time series. This will be the time series that you observe and you implement some model that's a function of like some parameters that you learn and uh, it's noise and fit it as best you can to like the time series of observations that you're making and you can study the the learned weights in order to determine causal relationships 
Um, it's it sounds like I mean I'm sure that there's like ways I I didn't really fully understand like this Z term. I know it's it's supposed to represent the underlying neurons that you're that you're observing, but uh, from the examples, I, based on what I've heard people do around here, it seems like maybe you you would have like some sort of synthetic neuron that is represented by this function, but. Uh, the important concept is that the observation and act, uh, actual phenomenon are decoupled by this equation. And uh, so uh, U represents like the experimental stimuli. So like an fMRI, if there's like some sort of task that you're doing, um, that would be represented by U. Uh, the neural parameters theta are the, the, the learned uh, weights that uh, tell you about the causal relationships of this observed time series. And uh, you study those to, for causal relationships. So in this paper, basically, they use a combination of the traditional method with vector, uh, uh, vector auto regression, which is a linear method, as sort of like their, their reference uh, to beat. And they, uh, they, they're predicting uh, intensities of fMRI time series for regions of interest. They also use a, uh, a, G, a DCGRU, which is a, a graph neural network that basically is a combination of graph convolutional networks and GRUs. So it, it's, a, uh, it's a graph, multiple graphs in time. And uh, they compare those methods. They use white matter tract information from DTI data in order to uh, give some context about the structure of the brain uh, to help uh, with predictions. I have a, a I need to interrupt, sorry. <laughs> um, you were talking about gradual causality and dynamic causal models that at least can be used <laughs> to detect directionality, et cetera. But now you jumped into something that is totally correlational bar and uh, neural networks. <laughs> Where did the other methods? Uh, uh, there is a transition for me that is. Uh, yeah, uh, I would say that the, uh, in their figures, the only place where they actually demonstrate causal relationships, uh, they use, they predict time series, and then they have, they like zero zero out regions of interest and. In uh, as their sort of like perturbation of like whether or not knowing about this region enables them to uh, predict activity in another region. So basically, they're removing like nodes of the graph or like portions of uh, of the matrices in the bar in order to determine whether there's an influence. But it, it's kind of like what Gregory causality does, right? Okay. Whether presence of that variable helps predict activity in that other variable mm -hmm. in the past versus future. So, so, okay. But war is just a Gaussian, uh, Gaussian uh, linear model, matrix multiplication times a vector plus some Gaussian noise independent Gaussian noise, and that's it. You just... I think they just use, I think they just compare their model to the bar model. Well, it's not a quantum model. Yeah, that's not. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree with the his commentary. Uh, there, uh, but there was there was one figure that sort of demonstrated like some causality. I'll get into it. I, I mentioned it already. Hmm. So um, basically, just so you can see what DTI data like can produce results that look like this. So it kind of provides you some information about like uh, the directionality of like uh, water flow within the brain. So, which is like the water flow should correlate with the white matter tracks. And uh, yeah, so it's basically a, the paper uses GNNs and, and time to, pr to predict time series. They use brain parcellation to come up with the regions of interest that represent the nodes in the graph. Uh, the DTI represents uh, connectivity versus the edges in the graph that are weighted to represent the connection strengths between brain regions. And graph his histories are used to predict future graphs uh, or regions of interest in time series. Um, what do they use the DTI for? Uh, they they use DTI to create the uh, so like this is from a different paper, but I, it had a good. I think even if I'm if they just just using this graph differently, I can kind of 
kind of apply to what they're doing so far. So basically, uh, the brain correlation like gives you like these nodes. Like so, this, this node would be like the average of the uh, intensity in a region uh, or a time window, and the edges would come from the DTI. So the edges come from DTI data. So it's for the edges. Yeah. They're predicting bolt signal, or they only predict the brain matter. Uh, they're predicting bolt the average bolt signal over that parcelated region. So, like, there's more bolt signal than, but it gets aggregated over the, the each parcel. How many parcels do they have? I think it's 360 or 306. I, I, I don't. I put the paper in the end somewhere, but I put it this presentation somewhere. But so basically, the uh, you have the graph, which is I've already described the the nodes, the edges, and um, the adjacency matrix, which is the structural connectivity, comes from DTI, as I've already mentioned, and the weights work like the, the the strength of the connection. So it's like it's almost like like in most GNNs you have to have like uh, a a graph that had, that you represent with like an adjacency matrix and like node features, and the the additional uh, what's happening here that I haven't seen before is that the, the adjacency matrix is also has weights that represents the connection strengths of those uh, relationships that give more context to make presumably slightly better predictions than the bell. Um, so you have this X matrix, X represents the, uh, so this is like the aggregated uh, bolt signal over a time course. So like if this is like one channel of, or like one region of interest, this would be like the aggregated bolt signal over 60 time courses. And there'd be 360 of these. And this is bar, so that, that's for the linear method. And this is for uh, the graph neural network, which does slightly better. This is from a graph, the graphic, graphic, the, the figure that I display later. Um, so, so basically, both the bar and the DCGRU are uh, having to learn this function H uh, that uh, the paper mentions, basically just formalizing what's uh, a time series prediction. So uh, you're using a time series, uh, like a history of time steps to, uh, to a specific point in time, and then you're no longer feeding ground truth anymore. And you you like make predictions into the future. T, uh, so like there's like a T zero, which is like where they cut all the histories, and from uh, T one to T F, they make predictions and see how much in, uh, error propagates over as a loss. Like the the error of the difference between the prediction and the actual prediction is the loss. But this is kind of a where like they take simplest. Um, like our model is not a good uh, forecaster model. What I'm hearing now and like for the last year or so, and uh, from um, Jovan's paper about transformers are poor, poor forecasters, that linear models like ARIMA and other, like slightly more complicated or more complicated, not even linear, but um, let's call it classical time series analysis model, are much better than uh, deep neural networks of any kinds as uh, forecasters. And here they're just comparing to one and going to nature. It's just their well, this is an old pay. I mean, it, this is sort of at the beginning of like the graph neural network explosion, I think. So, like, that, I think probably you'll find papers that are very similar, but using much more advanced uh, architectures to do the same thing. The reason I went back to this is just because they, uh, it, it was foundational. Uh, and a lot of the so that stuff that I mean, do. I mean, uh, the opposite, I mean, that. The field of time series analysis has already simple models that are much more powerful than deep okay. learning. And instead of comparing to them, they're keeping okay. using more powerful deep learning models, comparing them to Strowman for R. Uh, okay. so VAR is like the simplest imaginable model for time series. Uh, that, like, you can't go yeah, simpler can than one that. VAR. Uh, um, if you want dynamics, there is dynamics. There. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, one thing to mention is that the um, the DTI doesn't give you a direction in terms of like so the the, the JCC matrix is a sigma metric in terms of its weights, so you don't know 
like the direction of flow. Um, and ultimately, like I said, YT is basically the um, time series prediction. Um, basically, you have like a, a com graph convolutions are were, uh, are just a generalization of uh, regular convolutions um, in, a, in a certain sense. Um, the uh, Hadamore product, which is like the element element wise operation that occurs in a convolution, where you're like uh, element wise multiplying filters by the features, occurs uh, it, over the edges, and the depth of the uh, GCN is uh, basically like how many neighbors away uh, you go in the um, uh, front is basically it's kind of like your kernel size in a way for for um, CNNs. Embrace the graph interrupt. But graph solutions work on the graph that's given. So what is happening here? Uh, DTI graph. Uh, I I do describe the graph, I, I, but I should have already done so a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, but uh, do, do you apply it to the DTI graph? No, the DTI graph gives the, the DTI. Uh, so I go into it more. Let me uh, let me just pursue. Okay, it. if you if you can see if you get to it, that's fine. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to go into too much detail onto DCGRU. I mean, like I have slides to give an elaborate lecture on it, but in my, like basically after I look through it, it's. Essentially, what I described it as, which is like graph convolutions plus like GRU memory, and you can see that from the equations that I'm going to show you. But it was originally designed in order to predict, predict like traffic flows and like uh, like traffic of like cars and stuff like this. What does DC stand for? Oh. The first two letters. I don't remember. I think it's diffusion convolution. Diffusion. Yeah. Um, so like. You have all of the equations of GRU, except for you have this additional uh, diffusion convolution operation that occurs that allows you to handle the graph uh, nature of the data. So meaning that like you have all these gates, you have the, the reset gate, the update gate, and the like the active the the cell activation or whatever it's called in the context of GRU, which is like candidate activation. And uh, you use the the hidden state and as a form of memory to uh, like uh, allow back propagation through time to um, not have as much gradient decay. Um, and the way that you train them is back propagation through time. So uh, basically, like I was describing earlier, like back propagation is just. Uh, Iterating through uh, doing differentiation to the computation graph of PyTorch operations, and we do sequential uh, feeding back into the same model over and over again. This sequential computation graph that you can um, propagate through. The problem is, is that the gradient decay occurs, and so you have the memory, like I mentioned. Um, so there's limitations on how much, uh, how long the time series can be, and there's lots of optimizations like truncated back propagation. Time that occurred that you can use in order to like cut the the series length off to a fixed length and not have like really slow training times and things like this. But I, I kind of expect most of you to know about these things by now. No love spread propagation for the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, it's There you go. Yeah. So uh, here's just the uh, the formalization of vector auto regression. So. As you can see, it's basically just a linear method. You have like these different intensities of the fMRI. These would be matrices that the Y would be matrices representing the, the intensities of the volt signal average for the regions of interest. And then you use uh, ordinary least squares to solve for A, which is this uh, matrix of like that allows you to determine the, the, the significance of the relationships between the like, regions later. And then there's this error term that represents the noise. And the paper basically has the exact same equation, just in a slightly different way. So it's like, this is the error term, and these are like the different time forces.
Um, and as I mentioned, you use like ordinary with squares to solve for the matrices and ve uh, vector auto regression, which is basically you take this this function right here and you uh, you take its derivative, set it to z equal, and solve for, for the 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 coefficients of the described this bit line. Um, and for DCGR, you use gradient descent. Um, so I'm getting closer to talking about the graph again that Sergey was interested in. But um, so at a high level, I, I go into more depth this, uh, in the next couple of slides. But the uh, the structural connections from DTI data are used to create the edges of, of the graph that represents the time series and. The nodes uh, are the average uh, intensity values over parcelated regions. And this is kind of an example of parcelation where you basically get the regions of, uh, of, of the brain that get averaged to, to represent the nodes. And you can use different brain atlases in order to get different parcelations and things like this. So, and the, so the DTI also informs the edge weights. Right. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. So I, I just want to make sure. Um, but it's all, it doesn't, it doesn't give you direction on here. You can, it doesn't. So it doesn't. When it, it can give you just. It gives you the angle. weights, but the. No, the un unweighted. Yeah, no, yeah. I just want it, to make it, sure. Yeah, yeah. So the weights would be the value, the, the values in the adjacency matrix, and the adjacency matrix is symmetric. So there's no, like, it's not a directed graph, it's an undirected graph. What did they use to actually compute those edge values? It was structural. Okay, so that's definitely left out of the paper in detail, but it's called white matter check document. Okay. And so what what it the, the, as what this slide's about. So basically, if you imagine that DTI data is like some sort of voxel representation of like gradient flow, uh, and then if you do some, it's kind of like solving an initial value problem where like if you drop a bunch of like seeds in parcelated regions and you like let them propagate some number of steps and then you see where they end up and then you like take the total number of seeds and you did, like you can come up with probabilities of where if you just let them flow where they'll end up and you'll end up with the weights this way that's that's as good a description as i can give since it has a number of since this is the hcp i think it comes with essentially that kind of matrix uh, DTI, and I don't know if you can how easy it is to map to a parcel, but that's something important. That's what I was just wondering is what actual metric they use, and it's just the number of connections. It may be the number of bundles, uh, like, yeah, connections, not bundles. Like, yeah, it was a trip. It's all I've seen. I just was, you know, wondering if they had some weird thing that they were doing. No, but um, frankly, DTI, like how they compute it, is very, it's very uh, nice. tasty in mathematics. It's like very kind of full process. Yeah. It's an old method, but it works well, you know, for how long it's been around. Uh, so, <clears throat> so this is just the comparisons uh, between the, the, the GNN and the uh, bar. So, yeah, and some, so, some, 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 yeah, exactly. It's, come on, bar and stuff. yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So they, sorry, they compare to a VAR, and they give us this MA. The lag time step has a difference of what, 0.3, which. That may or may not be meaningful. I have no idea. It's hard to for me to conceptualize MAE without like training curves. And they give some training curves, but they're not, they skip the first 70 epochs. Um, <clears throat> so it's like, okay, this should it, it seems like this isn't a huge jump for what it should be, because VAR is a really simple model on purpose. VAR basically tells you, like, essentially, I don't know if I want to use the word stationary, but but how slow moving the signal is. Um, <clears throat> if, if the VAR model uh, predicts it very well, it's slow moving, right? Well, uh, VAR yeah. is con quite versatile. Um, yeah. So depending on the, the way you set the weight, it can capture a lot, but it's still Mark of order one, yeah. memory list, et cetera, et cetera. Everything like this, JNNs are endowed with lots of parameters, yeah. lots of much more. And, and since it's, it, it seems like, I like I, I wonder, 
if you just take it an LSTM with attention, like just the, the five now situation, I wonder if you'd get some uh, predictive results. I would think you would get good results. Um, the, uh, the My complaint about their figures was that they don't demonstrate that the DTI data is like the important factor and Man. the performance of the, the genome. So like the VAR, there's nowhere for the structural data to be in the equation. So I can't see how it would actually be in the equation. Um, Doesn't the DCRNN operate over a graph? It does, but the VAR doesn't. Like the, the VAR is using the regions of interest, but the VAR is not using the like the JCC well, matrix. Help. But the VAR matrix. should use a JCC matrix with weights as the transit. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Then I just said well, wait, wait, you mentioned that they used OLS to estimate something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so, so right. in the equation, it doesn't this in my mind, so the Ys would be the bold signals average for each region of interest in the A. Oh, so it's not Michael Porter one, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's P. Yeah, the HP is so I don't see yeah. where you would put um adjacency matrix weights for this. I think A just is like it's solved for it and Y is just from fMRI. But well, but A is technically your know, adjacency matrix what information transfers from the previous step to the next step. Of so the there's actually, there's there's a lot of work that essentially mixes a structural with a uh, functional graph. There and there's different ways to skin it. Um, but that would be interesting to see. Essentially estimate the VAR model from the functional, inject your structural into the uh, functional matrix and see what happens. Uh, excuse me, William, can you just repeat uh, like how VAR models train it? Just do, do they just use this uh, like connectivity matrices at all? They don't use any neural network for VAR model? It's no, OLS. our model was trained with ordinary least squares. So basically, like you have the um, okay, understood. So 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 basically, uh, they just kind of comparing <laughs> uh, var model, which is doesn't use any deep learning with uh, like uh, deep learning architecture in some sense. Correct. But, yeah. but nobody will stop you to use uh, deep learning architecture before calculating var. So. It's kind of word comparison in a sense, because yeah, yeah. neural network is just projection of the features, but uh, work can be computed on top of representations that you learn from neural network, and you don't have to use like uh, RNN even. You can just encode all the features like transformer or convolution or graph neural network. Right. Yeah, I think the only reason the paper got paper published in Nature is because of the time. Like, well, it's, it's, it's like scientific reports. Yeah, okay. It's just to... So it's not like Nature. Um, so this table basically demonstrates that uh, the, the, the error propagation increases so for if the uh, forecast horizon as it increases, which you would expect from any model, um, thought or aggressive model. And uh, this figure demonstrates how walk order, which is what they call it, but I would call it depth of the GNN, improves uh, prediction capacity. And this is pretty standard for GNNs. So if you go, it, there's usually a diminishing uh, returns in the depth of the GCNs in particular uh, because of over smoothing. So like the, the, it just, that, the aggregation method that they use to, to propagate the signal. Um, uh, ultimately, you lose information, the, the depth, the larger the depth. And so there's usually a diminishing returns point. And so, and also in terms of uh, computation, um, so the larger the depth, the slower it becomes. So, and they, uh, K equals zero is, uh, um, is, is basically not a GNN at that point, but K equals three and considers neighborhoods of uh, uh, regions of interest that are in local neighborhoods. So, uh, so this is arguably what they the causality part of their paper is, is they have this influence term that they calculate based on whether a region is is uh, in is in the calculation or not. So like they uh, they average out 
um, uh, this region and see if uh, knowing about the information in this region if helps the um, prediction of other regions. And they find that the closer to the PIBC region, which is kind of like an important region that controls several other regions, uh, whether it actually does have an impact on other regions. Um, they find that like the closer you are to the region, the more causal relationships there are, which seems reasonable. Um, and then they have some things that are just not like not that uh, interesting, like uh, pre-training and improves the results, which a lot of papers have demonstrated uh, over the course of since this paper was published. So not too surprising. Um, uh, one of their training techniques for the the, the RNN is the uh, uh, they have this prob sampling probability, which is epsilon, which allows them to so early in training they do the curriculum learning, which they see more ground truths early in training during their future predictions, and they slowly stop feeding it um, uh, the ground truth in order to make its future predictions until until the point where it doesn't get any. Uh, ground truth in its future predictions over in later epochs. Uh, presumably it stabilizes training. Uh, so I think that everybody's conclusions are kind of in line with things that I would agree with this that um, like the the causal relationships weren't the terribly mind-blowing uh, the but it was interesting to see uh, a, a graph neural network that has uh, uh, the capacity to work on a time series. That was one of the interesting things to me is because like, obviously, like I can think of like several places in um, brain imaging where you can use graphs to do analysis. And uh, like, for example, in my, uh, in my brain mesh reconstructions, uh, the, their triangular meshes, they, uh, they sort of replace like architectures like UNED and MeshNet with like a graph neural network that um, that samples on the, at the vertices of the, tr the triangular mesh as it is deformed to represent the white matter and the gray matter. But um, in the fMRI, this seemed to be an obvious way to represent your data as a graph, um, even though the bar is not that interesting. Um, uh, but the, the capacity to represent things as graphs, uh, it kind of, I think, is, it gives some simplicity and understandability to the model that that is appealing because graphs, uh, you can understand relationships in graphs pretty easily. Um, uh, so I, I, um, I, I don't think, I, I think that, uh, so when, uh, one thing I was hoping from this paper is that it would demonstrate some things like uh, the relationship of structure and function, but I don't think it demonstrated structure and function relationships in the way that it started to talk about in the introduction. Um, there were no graphs that like remove the edge weights from like the uh, the GNN in order to see if the 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 prediction quality diminished. It, but it would have been a fairly easy experiment to run, I think. Um, but uh, I, don't know, I didn't pick that up in their in their figures. So, so but I, I mean, I, I don't. In terms of making this useful, I don't. I don't particularly know how, how you like because like I, I thought maybe it'd be interesting if you could predict structure from function. But if you're in a machine taking getting your fMRI signal taken, you could be in a machine getting your structural uh, signals taken. So um, there, there there actually is there's a paper last year or something that tried to do that. Uh, not with deep learning, and it was predicting function from structure. Um, yeah. But, uh, like yeah, I think both ways. I have a paper like. <laughs> there you go. Um, you read. But overall, just having it seems reasonable that having context about structure and function would uh, augment your capacity to predict into the future. Um, I don't know. I have, I, I'm pretty new to this material, so I don't know that how this field has progressed since then. But I, and the, what I've heard from like maybe Joanne's presentations, it sounds like 
people have stepped up the types of architectures they're using into like transformers and other things, um, still building on DTI data and, um, but, and possibly graphs, but with more uh, advanced neural network architecture. So um, I think the cool thing about graph neural networks that's relevant to some stuff we do at the lab is that there's a paper that does uh, deep, uh, they call it functional connectivity for, for EEG with graph neural networks. Uh, so I think, you know, we should obviously do the same thing with uh, functional data and uh, you know, come up with an analog, a nonlinear analog to DM and C using the graph neural network structure. It makes it's obvious sense. It wouldn't be quite the same approach as this. I think you could use the structural connectivity as like a seed or something to start. Uh, but yeah, we're actually trying to learn the edge weights. It's a bit of a different uh, problem. But exactly, but even the edges have nothing to do with graph neural networks. Mm -hmm. They have to come from somewhere. So graph neural networks operate on a given graph. You can, there are tons of tricks of how to learn the graph, but they're all kind of ad hoc and they have not, they have no relationship to graph neural networks. Graph neural networks operate given the neighborhood, right? It, it's graph signal processing, essentially. It's about the signal on the graph as opposed to the Yeah, as opposed to recover the graph or estimate uh, there, the graph. I mean, there are a couple papers I can think of off the top of my head that, that do try to manipulate the graph. But so the EEG paper know. does. They do learn the graph. I don't know if they do it in an ad hoc way, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, I wonder, wonder like, what. <clears throat> I want to talk about that paper. So, mm -hmm. Ishad and I have been looking at it. Um, Is it a fresh? It's new, I think, relatively new. Um, yeah, that's interesting how, because like it's relevant to Sajjad's work and many of our work, uh, how do we uh, take those correlational models and learn uh, the causal graph? Or you leave this as correlation. You, know, <laughs> you don't fool with causation. Problem solved. Well, it doesn't exist, so. Yeah, Perfect. there's no such thing as causation. Yeah. It's not real. We're all, we're all here. Everything, yes. Yeah. Somebody throw something at Noah. And see if everything is happening all at once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's is too no. hard for me to smack him. <laughs> and then blame him for that because my head hurts. You hurt for no reason, Noah. You hurt for no reason. I'll tag you in that paper, Sergey. Uh, it's yeah. another nature paper. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not particularly like married to GNN. Uh, approach. I just uh, uh, no, no, they're, they're not bad. We're not criticizing. Yeah, yeah. It's just that each tool it has its yeah. own. Yeah, I think th this paper experimentally, I would have rejected it for how they kind of conducted things. But it's a fine approach. Like, why, why not do this? It's just mm -hmm. a bit. Should compare it more robustly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And does this yeah. paper like model functional regions that are not connected structurally or? Uh, so it's all of the all of the uh, regions are connected with an edge. Uh, the the only, all the edge weights being zero would be something that's not, for all intents and purposes, connected structurally. But they don't really say whether there's any any edge weights like are, that are zero. So I don't. Know. But I would think that there's probably their 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 little picture didn't seem to be fully connected. Just, uh, so Jordan, if you have a microphone, so the rules of the game here, you just uh, you know, you just start speaking. You're part of the group. Okay. Jordan has a question. Does Jordan okay. have a mic? Yeah, no, sorry, I was just uh, curious um, if the forecasting stage is at all similar to, um, uh, to, to the fine tuning stage that a transformer would do um, in machine learning. I'm just curious to see how, uh, how the field is advanced. I think somebody else brought something up, uh, a similar question. I, I was uh, I was parodying that. <laughs> I don't have a lot of knowledge of time series and transformers. I've used it mainly for uh, like uh, PITs and things like this for image processing. So I'm not gonna say. I don't think they do any fine tuning that you're, that I'm aware of. Uh, oh, I think they do actually. I think part of that is where they show that the fine tuning stuff. Right? Like, they did train. They did some pre trainings uh, with this uh, graph. Uh, um, so they they trained on one data set and test and then then did more more training on a different data set. Um, but uh, I don't know how that relates to this question in terms of the transformer stuff. So this other paper that does that, that learns the graph, what they essentially do is they have a generative uh, 
neural network that's gen that tries to generate the graph and then nice. you set to uh, estimate like with, the, uh, the weighted what, edges. What kind of generator? Uh, <laughs> a graph generator. Okay. <laughs> it's not cool. a um, That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's how most modern papers are using. Graph generated <laughs> networks. That's what that's all they call it, is graph generated networks. So, so does it generate a graph or it's a graph generating something? Well, it's it's a network that's that generates samples and they use some statistics on the, the samples generated to compute the weights. So it's like an indirect computation of the weights. This is we're looking at like a different paper now, but so what I saw people trying is like an autoencoder, but in a funky way is you generate the graph. It's more of a bar type model. Like you generate the graph with encoder. The encoder takes the time series data and produces a graph. And then you take this graph, use it in something like a bar model or you know one of those simpler models and generate the data from it and then compare it to the original data. And then you can uh, kind of... There there was at least one where I think it, it's been years, but I think it was for unweighted graphs, but essentially the updates uh, were almost like a um, genetic model. So they were changing the weights. It was still a neural network encoder decoder, but it was updating the, the, the actual edges based on some decision of remove edge, add edge. Well, uh, I wonder, this is totally, uh... Orthogonal question, but I wonder with this whole approach, like we, we're seeing <clears throat> anytime there is uh, under determinacy, many solutions possible. Like, yeah, under some models easy. prefer sparse solutions and they can get results as good as results. Some models prefer dense solutions. Uh, I wonder how that works when you're just trying genetically, like, will you? Fluctuate to some attractor where I'm like, okay, this is a sparse model attractor. They all fit. But yeah. like the feed thing is what Jude Pearl doesn't like and things like that. Like, oh, we're just doing core feed. Yeah, yeah, it's a tool. We're we're using tools that we have, uh, looking under the under the light. Yeah. yeah. Only only convex up average. Everything else is garbage. Gaussian convex, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Anything that's average. Non convex. Well, and um, me and Pavel, we think field with got two adventures. We should go back to MLPs and stay there. We should go back to linear regression. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I, you can keep your activation points. Yes, we have still work pretty well. Oh, yeah, I think so. Okay, yeah, thank you, William. That's, uh, yeah, that's an good. interesting. Uh, Paper and I'm I'm not sure if um, let me check the chat window. No, there was just one comment. <laughs> Any other questions from people online to William or Sorry, I missed why it was called the diffusion convolution because it's different from like a diffusion model, right? It's yeah. Different. Well, I mean, it is a diffusion in a sense that you're going further uh, from in the graph. I see. I think convolution in general is sort of thought of thought about. It's like a diffusion mechanism, like uh, the, the information is sort of becoming more diffuse as you go through the layers. And uh, it's almost like a blurry, like these filters as they're being applied iteratively over and over again, almost act like a blurring operation. Uh, I think people, there is no rigor in naming. Yeah. So it's, it's not probabilistic diffusion. It's, what I was... it's not probabilistic diffusion. There is nothing having to do with convolution either. Matching filter now is called convolution, although like I mean we those convolutional neural networks are not doing con and blah blah blah. Like it's, it's no no convolution at all, no diffusion at all. Yet we have to name this somehow. Well, diffusion in a physical sense, it is there. It's like further you go. And convolution in the sense of Moving the same matching field that are around, yeah, it's not convolution, but okay. yeah, yeah. But the, the smoothing operation, like the over smoothing quality of like GCNs, when like so, like you have like a like a temperature, like if you have a graph that represents tem temperature of a manifold, and you start applying these uh, these message packaging operations, like the, the information gets sort of averaged out over the graph, the larger the depth, the more deep the GCN becomes. So that's that's the reason I thought they were. 
I thought, with, back to Brad's comment, sorry, just chatting here, but um, uh, I thought about those words that we use. They are the same words through the years, but they change their meanings. Uh, one of the authors of uh, the NLP book, I forgot their, both of their names, but anyways, uh, one is from Stanford, and one was, ah, that word, sorry, sorry, people online watching, forgot all of the names. But in the lecture on word vectors, they had a fantastic demo from one of the papers that they found where a word is taken and um, word vectors for each period, historic period, uh, judging by the neighbors how the meaning of the word gay changes, how the meaning of the word broadcast changes. Right? And like the word convolution and the word diffusion and any of the scientific terms that we're using are like that. The meaning is totally changed. Like it's totally different meaning. Yeah, if you just sampled perhaps over the last 10 years, probably a random one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will be changed. <laughs> Same words, but they will mean different stuff. Yeah, that was actually kind of a weird part of uh, reading this paper. Uh, they talk about the depth of the GCN is like well ordered, which I've not encountered. But the, yeah, when you read like older uh, neural network papers, they kind of don't use the same terminology as the last few years. People know hardly use artificial neural network. The term artificial yeah. neural network, people don't use it. Yeah, I think there is a distinction because there were there was some people who kind of stayed in the uh, the field of like proper neuron modeling and yeah. like using the differential equations. I, I still see people call those artificial neural networks uh, where they're actually like modeling the set of differential equations, but. Yeah, but these. Uh, what about PDPs, parallel distributed processes? I haven't that's, seen that. <laughs> that that's one of the earlier ones. Oh, yeah. That's what neural networks are. Like. Yeah, what would they have been called if we had called them neural networks? Brain <laughs> boxes. <laughs> Brain. Is it nonlinear regression? <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of it. In LR. Stack nonlinear regression. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty philosophy <laughs> one. <laughs> no, but uh, I've heard. Uh, I heard not that your perception. Slightly, <laughs> slightly non yes. Mostly linear. Mostly. Slightly slightly linear. Mostly linear. Mostly linear. linear. <laughs> Some trends. I hate to keep the same acronym. You know? yeah. It's still NLP. <laughs> Sorry, guys, online. I think we're done here. We're just having fun because oh, yeah, uh, sure. that's what we're here for. And uh, thanks for people who connected uh, and watched this lecture and things really for presenting. I think uh, we will stop here and I'll see you next Friday. Here's your